Today is May 11th. This is Lessons of the 60s. We're interviewing Marina Hickian, a community organizer. The interview is taking place at 1844 Miltwood Place, a block that Marie lived on for many years. Present at the interview is Anne Gallivan and Bonnie Rowan from the Lessons of the 60s project. Our videographer is Eddie Becker. And Marie's husband, Jean Seymour, is here too. I'm Anka Decker. Hi, Marie. Hi, Anka. Tell us about where you came from. I came from North Carolina. Were you born there? Grew up and was born in Asheville, which is now so hip no one can stand it, but wasn't so hip when I grew up there. Um, went to college at the University of North Carolina. The first year it became not the woman's college. It had been the woman's college of the University of North Carolina. And the first year that I went was the first year they allowed men on campus. Good choice. Yep, 64? Yeah, 64. Fall of 64. Were you an organizer on campus? Oh, I ended up being, yes. What happened? Um, well, it was the 60s. There was a lot going on. Civil rights. Civil rights was a really big deal. Um, we did not have, um, we, still, we still referred to African Americans as Negroes. Um, the press even referred to African Americans as Negroes. Um, I guess there were two or three things that went on on campus. One was civil rights organizing and being supportive because Greensboro, North Carolina had a whole history um, you know, with the, um, the demonstrations at Woolworths, et cetera. Um, Anti-war was a big deal because of the Vietnam War. There was a lot of energy there. And locally, we ended up organizing um, a huge student strike of the cafeteria in support of the cafeteria workers who were trying to unionize. And today, you look at North Carolina and said, you know, there were union organizers. Yes, there were. Uh, and we won that strike. But we ended up organizing um, places for people to eat. We did a lot of bologna sandwiches um, because we didn't want people to eat in the cafeteria while the workers were on strike. So that was, that was important. Um, and I got involved with student press movement, which was a very important part of what was going on at the time. Um, I was the associate editor of the UNCG um, newspaper, student newspaper, that had heretofore been published maybe once a month. And we decided to publish it three times a week. So we were really crazed. We thought we were big time journalists and published the paper three times a week. So that was, that was for me, um, I had friends who were involved with SDS and Chapel Hill. Um, you know, it was, it was all of that period of the mid, you know, I started in 64, 65, so it had been 66, 67, 68 that I think a lot of that happened because it took me five years to get out of college. Was it difficult for you to be that kind of activist? Was that your family background? Um, no, I don't, I don't know that it was difficult. My father had been involved in union organizing or union whatever, at the Inca Nylon Rayon plant in Inca, out North Carolina, outside of Asheville, where they made parachute cord, among other things, for um, the war, World War II. And he remembers, prior to going in the Navy, um, demonstrating for Union and being hosed down by um, water hoses in the cold winter mountain weather with dogs. You know, they brought dogs out. Um, my grandmother had, was a widow and she had been a matron at the um, Nylon Rayon plant, at the Inca plant. And my mother, you know, my mother grew up in an orphanage in southern Florida. So I think 
the one thing that she used to impart is that you got to take care of everybody, and she did. She took care of everyone. Um, a lot of our life centered around the church, um, actually an Episcopal church, uh, St. George's, and we spent a lot of time um, taking care of people, so I don't know, maybe that's the history. Thanks. What brought you to Washington? Oh, U.S. Student Press Association. I had been very involved with them as a college newspaper editor. Um, a number of experiences along the way. And in 1969, after I graduated, um, I came to Washington in the fall of 69 to become the conference coordinator of the College Editors Conference, which took place in February 1970. And of course, the anti-war demonstrations were going on, and we were all living around DuPont Circle. Um, we were publishing daily the college uh, news service, college press service. And my job was to organize what turned out to be, ironically, um, the very first national gathering around ecology and the environmental crisis. And there were a lot of things born at that conference in February. Um, the ecology symbol we turned into a button, which I think I still have, many of, uh, black and white. Um, we, we used the phrase from Pogo about we have met the enemy and he is us. Um, so that led to the organizing that went on that became the first Earth Day in April of that same year. Um, this was a huge gathering. Um, there had been a split between Liberation News Service and College Press Service, so uh, Marshall Bloom and others who were involved with Liberation News Service, Ray, Ray Mungo, uh, was there at the conference. Uh, college newspaper editors from all across the country. Uh, the hog farmers came from... This was where? It was, <laughs> it was held at... Plainfield, Vermont. Yeah, well, the hog farmers came from Vermont to the conference, which was held at the Key Bridge Marriott. And the reason it was at the Key Bridge Marriott is because the year before the college newspaper editors conference was at the Shoreham, and there were some pretty heavy-duty protests at that conference around the Vietnam War, and there was also a conference of college football coaches going on at the same time, and it ended up with the college editors and the football coaches, and this would have been in 69, kind of having a big fracas in the middle of the Shoreham Hotel. So no hotel in Washington, D.C. would take the conference back again. Um, the Key Bridge Marriott was kind of, I think, naive. They didn't really know who we were. Um, so that's where the conference was. And um, I don't even know if the hotel's still there, actually. Still there. still there? Anyway, the hog farmers came and said, we're here to provide security. The hog farmers. Uh, from Vermont. Uh, Wavy Gravy, who you can see in all the Woodstock films. Wavy Gravy was there. At the end of the conference, I almost joined the hog farmers and left town, but I should have. It would have probably changed my life. Anyway, um, there were a number of things that happened at that conference. Um, Walter Hickel was a speaker, um, confronted by members of the Hopi Indian tribe. He was the Secretary of, of Interior. Um, and they confronted him um, in an elevator as he was leaving. I happened to be in the elevator trying to escort him out. And they confronted him and they said, Hickel, we've come to give you a message. And the elevator started to close and his security detail said, we got to go, we got to go. And he said, no, no, I want to hear what they have to say. And the elevator opened up again and they said, we're here to tell you that we're dying. And the elevator door closes. I mean, I'll never forget that. And um, 
you know, what was it, two weeks later, three weeks later that he resigned? I don't remember, I don't know the timing exactly, but it was, it was a huge impact. Um, <laughs> probably, excuse me, probably the biggest impact was um, one of the speakers, and all these people came because we asked him to speak, it was amazing. Uh, one of the speakers was Robert O. Anderson, who was the president of Atlantic Richfield Oil. And I'm on the podium beside Robert O. Anderson, who's giving this speech in this impeccable white shirt, tie, you know, suit. And some people came up on the stage, and I'm like, what's going on here? And walked up behind him as he's giving his speech and takes a can of sludge oil and pours it over his head. And it was like the hog farmers were probably who did it. They were supposed to be doing security. It was really Liberation News Service that did that, um, some of the folks from there. And Anderson was amazing. He reached into his breast pocket, pulled out his handkerchief, and wiped the oil off his face, finished his speech, and left. It was like, oh. Sludge oil over my head, so what? Um, the other thing that was huge significance at that event was that the, um, all of the defendants from the Chicago conspiracy trial came, except, of course, for Bobby Seale, who had been separated. But all of the uh, Chicago conspiracy defendants from the 68 Democratic National Convention um, events came to that conference and brought with them these yellow signs or yellow flags that were waved constantly by all of the people at the conference because the flags said bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> and uh, you know there they were was the Chicago conspiracy folks brought their flags with them so. Um, that's what brought me to Washington. That's a long story about getting to D.C. What did you do next? I actually got um, what was the most, probably the first significantly paid job that I had. I went to work for a nonprofit, as only you can in D.C., um, trade association called the Institute of Scrap Iron and Steel. And um, the guy who was the head of this trade association was really trying to cash in on the possibility of the environmental movement. So, I mean, what better thing to hire me who would run the conference? And he hired me as a writer. And um, I worked there and wrote, wrote a series of booklets on job occupations in the scrapyard. We were all funded by the, the old CETA uh, Comprehensive Education Training Act. Yeah, Act, right, was a CETA funded program. And we were training very low level, you know. Um, I remember that my, the books that I had to write, like how to drive a forklift and how to be a metal sorter. Um, all of these books were written like at the third or fourth grade level because we were training people for these jobs. And we made Super 8 movies. So we had a whole little film crew that did Super 8 movies for, uh, and I actually still have copies of those books. I don't know what happened to the movies. But I, so I had this job, paid me pretty well at the time. And that was my first job um, you until, also, until the, it, but then I also, that was when, it was shortly after that that I moved to Mentwood Place um, and got very involved with the neighborhood and the community and there was an organization around the corner called the New Thing Art and Architecture Center and it was upstairs right on Columbia Road. I don't know what's there now. Perry's? 
Is there an upstairs restaurant or something? Yeah. Well, it, it was uh, African drummers were up there too. Yes, Melvin Deal's African Heritage Dancers and Drummers were there too. And uh, Topper Carew, who was associated with the Institute for Policy Studies, um, Topper and Alice Carew lived right on Columbia Road, 1750, right, right across from what was in the Midtown Pharmacy. And they had this art program, for community-based art program, that did unbelievable stuff. Lloyd McNeil um, was an artist who did things with the kids there. Um, I have some of the original posters, I think, of New Thing Art and Architecture Center. And they did jazz concerts at the Episcopal Church there on, that's right on uh, Connecticut Avenue, St. Margaret's, St. Mary's. Right. Margaret. Yeah, St. Margaret. Um, so they did jazz concerts. Um, I think Topper started doing some films from there. And um, because I knew people at the Institute for Policy Studies and Carl Hess was the friend of a mutual friend and we found this house in Mentwood Place, 1829, and we moved into a group house. Um, Carl didn't move in right away. He moved in later, I think. And um, Wilson Clark, who was an environmental activist, um, moved in. A friend named David Preston, who, believe it or not, was in the Navy, assigned to the White House. And his job is that he was the only white member of the kitchen crew. Everybody else in the White House was Filipino, except for David. And David's job was to serve Spiro Agnew. But he lived, you know, he just went to his day job, which was the Navy job. And um, I can remember going to the White House one Halloween to pick David up from work. And we were in this Volvo station wagon. I don't know whose station wagon it was, but we all had on Nixon masks. <laughs> And, the, and, you know, the Secret Service was like, oh, that's kind of funny. You know, can you imagine, you know, that many years later? Um, David was not real happy in the Navy, and he finally got himself out of the Navy. He was actually a quite accomplished artist. Um, <laughs> so David lived there. One of the first things we had to do when we moved into that house was that Wilson Clark had been living in Judith Coburn's apartment on Biltmore Street. Judith Coburn was Clifford Clark's daughter? Right. No. Godchild or Godchild or something. niece or something. Anyway, she was very involved with anti-war journalism. Um, and at the time that we, that Wilson was living in her apartment, she was working for the Village Voice as a correspondent, actually a quite well-known one at that point, and she was in Cambodia. Um, so when Wilson moved in with us, we had to go move all the things out of Judith Coburn's apartment, and that's when we discovered five years' worth of Village Voices stashed under her bed. And we never knew what, I don't know what happened to those papers. I just didn't remember having to carry them down flights of stairs. Um, but we lived at 1829 Mintwood, um, which is how I got involved with neighborhood work. There was some sort of conference in town that Carl was involved in, right? Yes. 1970, I guess it was, the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention. Largely dominated, I don't know who all the parties were that dominated it, but um, obviously the Panthers were very involved and uh, Carl was involved in the conference. It was at All Souls Church and it was held at Thanksgiving and I'll swear I think it was Thanksgiving morning that Carl came to me and said, Marie, do you have a credit card? And I was like, I have a credit card that belongs to the Institute of Scrap Iron and Steel. And he said, we need this credit card right away. And I said, OK, what do you need the credit card for? He said, we have to rent a car. And I'm like, OK, 
we have to rent a car. And finally he said, look, I have to rent a car for the Panthers because Huey Newton is coming to town and he has to have a car. And I was like, okay. So we get on the phone and the only car we can find on Thanksgiving morning is at National Airport. So we drive out to, oh, we, were, we have to drive to National Airport to get the rental car. But we stop on the way at All Souls to pick up two Black Panthers who were going to be the drivers. So we get to the airport and the two guys, I don't know their names, but the two guys say, oh, we can't, we can't have this car. And I said, it's the only car we could find. It has to be a black car. I said, we, it's a yellow Ford. And he was like, no, no, Huey won't ride in this car. And I said, it's the only car we can rent. So they finally, um, you know, took the car, drove it off, and I never saw the car again. Um, Huey Newton and the Panthers kept that car for a very long time because this was in November of 70, and it must have been early 1971 that one day um, these two people show up at the Institute for Scrap Iron and Steel, and I'm asked to come and sit in the conference room with these two gentlemen, and guess where they're from? They're from the FBI. And so it's, it's a good cop, bad cop, because the bad cop guy looks at me and says, how long have you known Huey Newton? And I said, Huey who? Um, anyway, there were a series of interviews with the, New York, with the FBI about my having rented this car. But the amazing thing was that the Panthers paid for it. I, I was always afraid that, you know, I think my boss at the Institute of Scrap Iron and Steel was kind of concerned because they've had this car for several months now that no one would ever pay the bill on the American Express card. But we didn't have to pay it immediately because no one kind of put the two and two together until the FBI showed up. And um, shortly thereafter, I no longer had a job at the Institute of Scrap Iron and Steel. Thank you, Carl Hess. Thank you, Huey News. <laughs> And it was a great job. I mean, it was, you know, a regular salary. So that's, um, that's when I, Carl Hess got me a job working for Richard Burnett at the Institute for Policy Studies. And the rest, I guess they say, is history because my, my activist life continued my organizing life from that point forward. What was that like? <sighs> IPS was, was like no place I had ever really experienced before. Um, Dick Burnett was working on Roots of War, his book Roots of War, and then the next one was the, um, was the corporate, oh boy, I'm, this is terrible. Global Reach. Global Reach. He had just started research on Global Reach. His office was across this little hallway from Mark Raskin's office, and I was Dick Barnett's, quote, assistant. Um, he evidently had gone through a lot of assistants. Um, and, you know, it was fine. I did research for Global uh, Reach. Um, it was also the period of time when Ellsberg was there. so. I was kind of exposed a bit to the research that was going on around the Pentagon Papers. I mean, it was, IPS was clearly a center of a lot of the national organizing was going on. I, however, w got more and more deeply involved with the neighborhood and what was going on in Adams Morgan. Um, you know, Adams Morgan had a history already. There had been some early neighborhood organizing out of St. Margaret's Church, um, I think there had even been probably some funding. Uh, if I remember, it was Stephen Klein who had the, the archives from those years. Uh, Stephen lived on uh, Biltmore Street. So there had always been, and he worked at AID at the State Department, but there had always been a lot of kind of neighborhood civic activity, as it were. Um, 
And it was that, that particular time I was also exposed to Milton Kotler's work um, at IPS who um, wrote a book on neighborhood government. And it was that whole seed of neighborhood government and really leadership from a number of people, but specifically, I think, Topper, Carew. Um, certainly Milton was involved, although he didn't live in the neighborhood. But Topper was the one who knew a lot of the, the key people in the neighborhood. And so we embarked on this project to organize a neighborhood government. We were going to have our own independent government because there was no home rule. And so we figured, well, we'll just elect our own government and organize it. And we met every Saturday for hours at the Potter's House, um, which hadn't been open too long, but had, was there. And it was a coffee house. And we met there every Saturday morning to try to come up with a constitution and a bylaws on how we were going to organize our neighborhood government. And um, we came up with the whole concept of single member districts and electing five delegates from each single member district within Adams Morgan. And I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact boundaries. Certainly 16th Street and Connecticut Avenue, probably, what's the street right off of the bridge? Um, Ashmead, Ashmead, Calvert Ashmead that way over to Connecticut Avenue as far south as um, went down further, Swan T. I don't remember what the southern boundary was, but it includes Swan Street and T Street and you want to S Street. Rap? Oh yeah, Rap was there on Willard Street. So that had to be. You know, that, that so it was that far down. Anyway, so we had these five single member districts and we moved forward to elect our neighborhood government and we formed something called the Adams Morgan Organization, um, which took on an amazing kind of series of things that we did. Um, there was there was an economic development committee that led to creating um, worker-owned co-ops like Fields of Plenty. Um, Stone Soup was a little bit more independent. I'm not sure they were really connected so much directly, but they were further down the hill. But certainly Fields of Plenty. And one of, one of, the, one of the funny stories I can remember from Fields of Plenty is that there had never been a store where you had items in bulk where you had something where you put this scoop in and scooped it into a bag and you bought oats or fruit or whatever it was, the health department went wacko. Oh, you can't have this. And we ended up having a rather protracted back and forth with the DC government and the health department over how we could display things at Fields of Plenty, which was which was on uh, 18th Street, I think right where this coffee house is now. Um, the ammo office was a few doors down from that, and um, Carl Hess, Carl Hess organized the Science and Technology um, Committee and decided that among things, we were going to build uh, entrepreneurship around issues of food. So in a warehouse on Champlain Street, he started growing fish. Had a lot of youth involved in growing the fish. The problem was that the electricity in the warehouse was not particularly reliable. So the electricity would go off and the fish would die. And we would start all over again. Uh, I'm not sure we ever had any fish that we were able to eat because we couldn't keep the electricity on in the warehouse. Now, Carl, if he were here, rest his soul, would probably tell me that, yes, we did eat fish from the, from the uh, community technology. But he was involved in all kinds of things around technology and community science. And, uh, but the fish were the big project. Um, 
Community Park West came out of an ammo committee. Um, Walter Pierce lived in the neighborhood. Walter and his, um, you know, the whole group of youth in that neighborhood had played on that park for years. Um, one of the great lessons that I learned about community, about community organizing came from the community, the, the community park west experience. There was a garden. There was a community garden. And a lot of different people uh, grew in this garden. But it was kind of like a hodgepodge. I mean, there were not plots. There was not this. There was not that. But a lot of people, you know, had tomato plants and beans and whatever. And it was a very diverse group. A lot of Latinos who were growing, um, you know, older white folks. A lot of black folks were growing in the garden. And there arose a big controversy because someone one night stole a lot of the tomatoes. The tomatoes were gone. And people were very upset because that had never really happened before. And what resulted from that was that there was big discussion and they decided, okay, we have to have individual garden plots. Divided up the community garden, assigned these plots, and you know what? The garden never worked again after that. It was like, oh, that's my plot. No, that's my plot, you know, and it was this constant back and forth. I don't know what's happened to the community garden, whether it's still there, but I hope it's just people growing tomatoes. That would make a big difference. Can you tell us about your work in housing in this neighborhood? Right. There's one other community park story. Yeah. Say what it is now. Say what park it is now. Called Walter Pierce Park. It's called the Walter Pierce Park. Right. Thanks, Tony. And the way we ended up getting the money to buy it, because it was owned by the Shapiro family, is that we had this huge television. And someone, because we had this community technology committee, learned how to make video of some sort. I think it was Nick DiMartino that started that project. And we made a movie about Shapiro Park and com what became Community Park West. And we had this, <laughs> Walter Pierce did this, we loaded this big hunk of wooden television on um, like a dolly that we took to Congress. And we hauled it around from congressman to senator to congressman to senator and showed this movie to anybody who would watch it because we wanted Congress to approve the money to allow the district to buy Community Park West. It took about two years, but it worked. And that's how the park got to where it is today, which is now Walter Pierce Park. But that was an important learning kind of curve for me as a community organizer because you can have a lot of ideas and strategies, but if you can't think through how you're going to deal with it, ultimately and on the money side uh, was a really important one. And that kind of became a really key issue around housing. Um, you ask about my work in housing. Housing became a big issue because um, gentrification was starting to really take off in Adams Morgan. Um, we started organizing and doing rallies and having tenant groups and probably one of the most powerful organizing tools we had was Antioch School of Law, which was up on 16th Street and they sent a lot of their law students who became interns um, and worked as, you know, legal um, folks with a lot of the tenant groups. Um, they worked out of the ammo office. So the housing committee, because ammo had this series of committees that I've described, but the housing committee was a big one. Um, the housing committee, I mean, there was, there suddenly became so much going on on so many blocks and so many buildings and, 
these developers and all this pressure. A couple of things had happened, though. Um, Rap Incorporated was on Willard Street. It was um, it was a, it was a drug treatment program. In it was much more than that. It was a community organizing arm that really pulled in a lot of kids. Um, rap, you know, can always be depended upon to to be there when you needed people. Um, and we we were doing, um, we didn't call it gentrification for crisis. We called it displacement. Mm -hmm. So we would do these anti-displacement rallies. Um, I guess this is what, 72, 73? The beginning of condos, the conversion of all the apartments Condos, most of them. Right. Condos had started um, doing some condo conversions. Um, the law had changed that made owning rental housing not so wonderful uh, in terms of the, the favorable tax treatment. So that had changed. Nixon was in the White House. And for all the things you can say really awful about Richard Nixon, when it came to the District of Columbia, Richard Nixon was an interesting advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, wage and price controls is what allowed us to get a local rent control law, which allowed us to have a lot of the very progressive housing legislation that came out of that. Um, and it was, you know, it was wage and price controls that he did on a federal, national level that allowed that to happen in the District of Columbia. Um, we organized, we got a very, at that time we thought very strong rent control law. Probably the strongest parts of the law were right of first refusal. If you lived at that time initially in a single family house, you had to be offered a right to buy the house before the owner could sell it because so many of our families were in rental housing in Adams Morgan. Um, the second thing is that it did set out basic controls on eviction. So you couldn't just walk in and lock people out, which you can still do in some places in the country. Um, but in that sense, there was a, a very strong legislative framework. But prior to that, um, there was a lot of, of organizing, there was a lot of tenant organizing that went on around that. After the first rent control law, there was a second law that was passed um, that extended the right of first refusal to multifamily buildings. And ultimately, down the road, after Marion Berry was elected mayor, um, we converted 3,000 units in three years to tenant ownership, from tenant rental to tenant ownership as cooperatives. Uh, a lot of those buildings still remain today up and down Columbia Road. Anka lives in one. Certainly I lived in one at one point, having been gentrified off of Mentwood Place. Um, you know, when I left Mentwood Place, the Washington Post actually wrote an article about how I was being, quote, displaced from that one place. Um, so it had become an issue. Oh, yeah. It had become an issue. Would, the organizing had made it an issue. Right. Um, Tell us about Seton Street. Seton Street. Oh, Seton Street was amazing. Um, I, I got a call from Miss Harvey, Lavinia Harvey. There was another key person in this, and her name was Fanny Hill. Miss Fanny was this amazing woman who cooked. She cooked for everybody. And somewhere along the way, PG, PG, who's the gas works? Washington Gas and Light. And Pepco. Yeah, but it wasn't, it wasn't Pepco, it was Washington, Washington Gas and Light, Light had hired her to, as kind of this community ambassador who would show up all over the city and show people how to cook with no money. 
I actually still have her cookbook. I helped her write this cookbook. She and I also ran a restaurant on 18th Street at one point, but that's another story. <laughs> anyway, Miss Fanny was this kind of person who, she lived in a little house on Z Street. And, you know, she would just materialize all this food. And she used kids. Her kids baked everything, cooked everything. And so a lot of the organizing that we were doing was successful because people would come because they knew Miss Fanny was cooking. So people would show up for any meeting that she was cooking for. Miss Fanny did food demonstrations for all of these community events where she would come in and show you how to cook with no money. Um, she did some amazing things. As I said, I still have her cookbook, which I helped her write. Miss Fanny um, was a part of the big success of organizing in Adams Morgan because she would always come. And Miss Fanny used to refer to me as her play daughter. Um, she was also big with a lot of foster kids and she and I actually shared a foster child once. That's a very interesting story from a school board member as to how I ended up with this foster child named Kyle. Um, Miss Fanny called me up and Miss Harvey, who lived on Seton Place, called me up and said, there's something going on down here because we all got these letters. And we went and looked at the letters and the letter basically said you have 30 days to get out. A developer had bought the entire, every rental property on the, on the block. And we were like appalled. That was a whole, it was 27 families. It was like, what are you doing? Um, we had just gotten the home rule. I mean, uh, the, just gotten the um, rent control bill in place. And there was this little obscure thing in there about the right of first refusal if you lived in a single family house. And I was like, well, this should apply. We weren't sure how it would apply, but this should apply. I had also been appointed to the first rent commission. So we were in the process of writing regulations for it. And had continued. I no longer worked for Ammo as the executive director. I was the first executive director, but I no longer worked for them full time. Um, I had gone to work for Common Cause around the Home Rule campaign. Um, I had worked for NPR for a while. And so once we started to look at this piece of paper, I kept saying, well, we should be able to do something. And so I went to Johnny Barnes. Johnny Barnes was a young attorney uh, working at the Georgetown Legal Clinic. And I said, Johnny, don't you think there's something we can do about that? And he was like, well, yeah, I'm not sure what. But he wrote a letter to the developer and said, you violated local law because these families um, deserve their first right of refusal. There are many ins and outs of the story of how this rolled out, but most significantly, we ended up in court. And the families were amazingly strong. You're not putting us out of our houses. We started doing fundraising. Um, Frank Smith had become, I guess, the chairperson of the Adams Morgan organization at the time. Uh, I was sitting on the rent commission. Johnny Barnes was headed the legal thing, and finally, somewhere along the way, Johnny said, I don't think I can represent 27 families, and we got, um, I want to say Arnold and Porter, but I'd have to check to make sure, but we got a major law firm to represent these families. So at that point, we would go into court before the judge, and there would be 27 families, 27 cases. Um, the developer, and the slew of corporate attorneys. And finally one day, the judge looked at the courtroom and said, you know what, y'all need to go outside and figure out how you're going to settle this, because if you don't, we're going to end up in the Supreme Court. So we never litigated the issue of first right of refusal. We actually went out and ended up settling. And the developer agreed to sell the houses to the family. 
Huge victory. And then it was like, none of them had any money. How were we going to pay for these houses? Well, we'd been doing fundraising, and then, of course, the families started to get a little panicky because we only had so much time in which to meet this right of first refusal. And about that time, there had been uh, an effort to build a, a branch of perpetual savings and loan at 18th and Columbia Road. Ammo, once again, was very involved. And at a federal level, they had, there had been some legislation passed called um, the Community Reinvestment Act. It had just been passed. And so with research done, um, and Eddie, I'm sure you'll be able to fill in on the research, because it was a, it was a community-based research and education group that Perpetual Research Group. The Perpetual Research Group. So we're still going. That's good to hear. Anyway, they were very involved in putting together the framework. And we filed a challenge before the Federal Home Loan Bank Board because Perpetual refused to provide mortgages for these 27 families to buy their houses. And that's a very simplistic over, overview of what happened. Had the Nader one, John Brown. That's right. Public interest research group. He was with the Ralph Nader research. I had forgotten about John Brown. We also had another group of Nader lawyers around the Federal Communications Commission, but that was a whole other project that AMO was involved in that had to do with ownership of media. Anyway, that, that was a very important work that we did at that point. But um, we filed a challenge at the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, and the Federal Home Loan Bank Board members, I actually have met since then uh, a woman who was a member of that board who looked at me and said, I remember that because there were no regs. We didn't know what to do. Once again, the pressure ended up with negotiations with Perpetual, who agreed to provide the mortgages, and um, agreed to build the building in a way that there would be a courtyard and a place for community gathering, which ended up being, of course, the farmer's the market. New bank building. Right, in the new bank building at 18th and Columbia Road, which I think today is still there. Um, I understand it may not be there too much longer, but um, so the families were given the right to buy their houses. They got the mortgages, and then it was like, these houses have to be rehabbed. And perpetual, that was one of the big issues, is that they didn't want to write mortgages for houses that were falling apart in many ways. They were, you know, very small, two-story um, houses. So we started looking at where to get the money and determined, of course, that the best source was federal um, rehab loans that came through the District of Columbia. But when you looked at the map for where you could get a rehab loan, all the map was that was colored that you could get loans there, um, there was not one block in Adams Morgan where you could get a community development loan. And at that point, we took on the city council and um, the Department of Housing and Community Development, DHCD here, and finally they designated by special resolution one block <laughs> in Adams Morgan, which was the 1700 block of Seton Street, that could qualify for rehab loans. The next big hurdle of trying to keep these 27 families intact, some of whom were very, were older senior citizens, uh, and this battle went on for three or four years. Uh, and trying to keep them intact was very hard. It was a very, very critically important piece of housing history and affordable housing history in the District of Columbia. Um, I remember going through the agony of where were the families going to live while rehab was going on. And they got relocated. Um, I think two of the families didn't make it back. 
to their houses after rehab. One passed away. Um, but that was the saga of Seton Street, which led to the second round of the rent control law, which then incorporated the extension of right of first refusal to multifamily buildings that ultimately spawned thousands of rental units being converted to tenant-owned co-ops that still exist today, that many of us lived in and still do today. You've talked before about the importance of housing to women and the importance of women as housing organizers. Oh yeah, it was always the women. Always the women who organized and kept the organization together. Um, I, I remember uh, a tenant group, you know, even, even the Latina, Latino families, the Latina organizers. I remember a, a group of families um, on 18th Street. Um, all of the members of the Tenant Association were women. Why do you think that is, that it was? Because women are the ones who keep the family together, who worry about, are my kids going to have a place to live? Um, and I think that, that was a huge motivation. I mean, I can remember having some, quote, political discussions about whether or not housing was a woman's issue. Housing was definitely a woman's issue. Um, because it was mostly women who were doing the organizing, doing the tenant work. Um, not 100%, but probably 80 or 85% were women. Um, it, you know, and uh, to this day, the building that I lived in, um, Plaza West on Columbia Road, all of the officers of that tenant co-op were women. Uh, and to this day, as far as I know, one of the original officers, who Anne McCain, who was the secretary of that co-op, is still, I mean, she may have finally resigned, um, is still the secretary of that co-op board and, and the keeper of the history. Um, so I think that that was always the case, that um, women were able to see what was in their own best self-interest mm -hmm. in a way that I think men were never forced to have to think about. Um, and a lot of it had to do with children and families. Can you tell us about some of the people you work with here in the neighborhood? Um, Dorothy, John? Wow. You've talked about Johnny Barnes. Johnny Barnes uh, was an important attorney. Um, Certainly the folks at Antioch Law School were really committed and the leadership at Antioch was very committed. Um, Edward Jackson, Ed Jackson who lived on Ontario Road, Ontario Road you're right, um, was a key person. He always headed up every few months a community cleanup where he would have people out shoveling and raking and cleaning up the neighborhood to keep it clean. That was, his, that was his niche, that was his commitment. But he was a very important leader. He was very involved in his church community, his whole family. He was, he was a homeowner, a longtime homeowner on Ontario Place. Um, Charlotte, I'm sorry, I, I have to stop and think. She lived, um, she had been displaced from Ontario Place at one point, which is where Walter Pierce and his family live, Charlotte. And then she moved to uh, a house that was actually on Columbia Road. She was a key person. In every one of these single member districts, there were key leaders. Carol Davis on Lanier Place, which of course had been uh, home to a lot of the old SDS organizers and anti-war organizi organizers. Um, you talked about Johnny Wilson before? Yeah. Johnny Wilson was a key person. Yeah, but, but all right, you all are going to have to help me out here. He ended up being, he ended up being a uh, legislator in California. 
who lived on Ontario Place. There was a collective of people who lived there. Um, was Rennie Davis there? I think Rennie Davis was there. On Carl, what on Lanier Place? What was he was he was involved with Jane Fonda? Come on. Carl. Carl? No, it wasn't Carl. Tom Hayden. Hello. Tom Hayden, of course. Oh, Tom Hayden. Who became a legislator in California? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Tom Hayden lived on Lanier Place. So where? Near the fire station, the house near the fire right, station. Right, right next yeah. to the fire station. Because right. Carol Davis lived on the other, BB. other BB. side. So when did Hayden move on? Had to have been 74, mm -hmm. maybe 71 to 74. There, were, there was a rotating number of people who lived in um, that particular house. There's an apartment building, mid-block on Lanier Place. I have no idea what it's like now. But that's where Dorothy McGee lived. And Dorothy McGee was a key part of everything that went on in the community because she was the publisher of three different underground newspapers. The Daily Rag, Colonial Times. Boy, who can remember the Colonial I think Colonial Times was first, then the Daily Rag, and then Newsworks. Um, there was another community newspaper. Bob Pullman was involved. Um, as was called the Rock Creek Monitor. Jude Franco. Jude Franco. And there was another person I want to Brian. say. Brian. No. Brian who Rock works Darby. for... Darby? Brian who works for the, it's not the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, but the Federal Housing Finance Agency. I think he's, I don't know, maybe he's retired. Who um, helped organize the Pacifica Station here in town? 39 years ago. Yeah. I was on the first PFW board. Uh -huh. um, it was a huge battle over getting the license. Pacifica had applied for the license. We finally got the license. And then there was another huge battle between the Pacifica National Board and the local folks over how black the station would be. Because the national you know, movement left folks wanted to control the station, but the local folks wanted to control their own station, so there was all this tension there um, that led to Jazz and Justice Radio, and that was, it was a big deal when we, as a local board, agreed that we would play only jazz, and that's what we started out as, paying, playing only jazz. I then was elected to the National Pacifica Board, um, as a part of that effort, um, and of course the station's still there. It's gone through its struggles and continues, but I can't believe it was 39 years ago. I figured that out yesterday, I think. It was 39 years. Um, and of course then we, the whole issue of homelessness surfaced for the first time. We never had homeless people. I can remember doing an interview with the New York Times who was writing about the Coalition for the Homeless and Mitch Snyder and the Community for Creative Nonviolence. And I, I read that interview again recently and I was like, I can't believe I said this, but I actually said, in Adams Morgan, we didn't have homeless people because people kind of took care of each other. And if there was somebody who I can remember Walter Pierce's mother used to let everybody under the sun, you know, if they needed a place to stay, they would, you know, you knew where people could go and stay. We didn't have that level of homelessness. Um, but as the gentrification or displacement spread and as the economy um, got more and more difficult. Um, About what year was it that you noticed homeless people in Washington? When did that surface? Well, Jimmy Carter was elected in 74? No. Okay. Ford so, comes in in 74 after Watergate and uh, Carter that's comes in right. 76. 76, okay. So it's about 1976 that some very significant yeah. things happen. Namely, wage and price controls get lifted which had been imposed by the Nixon administration. Nixon was like the last president 
ever fully fund the development of affordable housing because it was under Nixon that Section 8 program was created. Once that came to an end and wage and price controls came to an end, prices started to spiral out of control, both in terms of rental housing and, of course, we had the age-old argument in the District of Columbia that, wow, you have rent control. You know, no one's going to build any rental housing as long as you have rent control, even though new rental housing would have been exempt from rent control. Um, that was, you know, that was always the argument economically. Um, so we began to see, I think that was kind of where, um, because what happened is wage and price controls were lifted under Carter and if you remember, interest rates hit 23%. And everything spiraled out of control. It was at that point that I went to, I was working for the Barry administration at this, the local housing department and we started the Tenant Purchase Assistance Program where we put in place a whole series of things to help tenants buy their building. That's when we did 3,000 units in three years. We had an innovative grant from HUD. Patricia Robert Harris had been the secretary of HUD. Um, we had other grants that we were able to put in place and the whole theory behind tenant purchase was if we can get folks into ownership by the building and we had technical assistance we funded, Muscle and Metropolitan Washington Planning and Housing who would come in with a team of people to provide technical assistance and organizing and getting people because you had to exercise your right within a certain period of time. 180 days, I think. Or maybe it was 120. And it all worked very well except that the premise was get people into ownership. Once the co-op owned the building, then it would be pretty easy to get long-term mortgages. The problem was that long-term mortgages hit that 22, 23 percent and nobody could afford that. So it was a real kind of panic to figure out how to do that and there was an insurance company that actually came to the table, Jim Gibbons, was it Gibbons? No, Jim, who was the president of this insurance company and he agreed to give mortgages to the tenant co-ops. I have to track down and think through his name, uh, which was pretty amazing in and of itself. They also started a group called SAMCO, the Consortium of That's Lenders. That's right, of lenders who would finally loans. make the construction loans. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it was at that point that, that I decided I should run for city council because I ran for city council twice. Yeah. Once at large, which I think was, was a much more exciting time and then of course once for Ward 1. But um, it was the first time I started to work kind of professionally as an affordable housing developer and then I was elected president of the new coalition for the homeless. And Community for Creative Nonviolence and Mitch Snyder had, um, had an issue on the ballot, giving people the right to shelter. Mm -hmm. And the Coalition for the Homeless, which was all of the various nonprofit neighborhood groups who had come together to try to do programs, etc., for homeless people. Dennis Bethay was a, was a leader in that whole group, um, took a rather novel position of opposing the ballot question for the right for shelter. It was, it was very, very divisive. But as chair of the Coalition for the Homeless, I had to speak for that position, which was very, very hard. Um, because I'm not sure I ever really agreed. But the big concern was that if you were going to have a right to shelter, what you were going to end up with was big warehouses. Which is exactly what happened. Um, because that was the only way you could, 
you could provide that kind of basic right to shelter. But the ballot initiative won, you know, passed. So the District of Columbia, is, unless it's been changed, I don't think it has, like um, New York, you have a basic right to shelter, which does define in some very clear ways um, the government's responsibility to support people who need housing. Um, in New York, it's been on the books for a very, very long time. But Your city council races, what lessons did you learn from those? Well, I think the... I ran for city council because I thought I could use that as a basis for organizing on a, on a wider basis. Um, and I think there was a point in time when the government was still very new that that might have been possible. But I think by the time I ran for the Ward 1 seat, it had deteriorated into electoral politics, business as usual, and it was a question of, of you know, who could do what, you know, with whatever people at the polls. And I think that my, my, um, my race for city council in Ward 1, you know, posed a real racial dilemma for a lot of people who thought, well, we should vote black, uh, as opposed to looking at issues. And I think that the, those, that was a difficult time. It was a very difficult time for me. It was a very difficult time for a lot of people. Uh, who told me, Marie, I really would like to support you, but I cannot. What year is this? Why would you ask me this? <laughs> I have to stop and think what year it was. Um, maybe you should maybe you should put it on no, pause. Go ahead, just figure it out. Um, is it 78? 78. 79881882. Yeah. Yeah, it was 78. So that was Frank Smith against Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I don't and know what the... girl, you did it a second time? No, no, that was the second time. Oh, that was the second time. The first time I ran at large, okay. for city council at large, placed, I think, I found out the other day, I think I placed third. H.R. Crawford won that seat. Uh -huh. I remember him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, two Admiral people that ran. No, that was the second time in Ward 1. Yes. That was Frank Smith. That was Frank yeah. Smith who had become chairperson. And Frank had never been involved historically, but he was also involved with, with IPS. He was a fellow at IPS. Yeah. And, of course, then there's the whole saga of my role at IPS when, I, when Dick Barnett fired me because he said I was spending way too much time, you know, dealing with work that wasn't his. And I said to him, well, I don't know why you can't use your own finger to dial your own phone. And I think it was the next day that I was told, you know, Marie, you really should find something else to do. And that's when I kind of started freelancing and working, you know, um, in the neighborhood stuff full time. But I subsequently was among the first group of women nominated to be a fellow at IPS. Arthur Waskow nominated me to be a fellow, and Charlotte Bunch was in that group. So it was this group of women because the big controversy at IPS was there were no women. There were no women fellows. So I was among that first group. And as it was related to me later, I wasn't there, but it was related to me later that... Um, I wasn't elected because the work, I guess the big debate was between Mark, you know, Mark and Dick Barnett, Mark Raskin and Dick Barnett made the ultimate decision. The other fellows were involved, but they made the ultimate decision. But my work was not considered academic enough, you know, scholarly. I was not doing scholarly work. Community organizing was not considered scholarly enough. Even though we were doing a lot of stuff that challenged basic economics and on and on and on. Um, but that would have, 
being nominated as a fellow might have significantly changed my life as well. I probably would have never run for city council. So tell us uh, what all this amazing experience, how it's informed your life since then. Well, I guess it depends on who you might ask, but from <laughs> my perspective, um, everything I did after that was about organizing. Uh, I worked as a affordable housing professional and I went on to work um, initially and I, I left the um, district in um, 85, yep, in 85 and went to Philadelphia where I was a neighborhood, um, what they called a neighborhood development fellowship and I built a huge amount of housing in North Philadelphia, much of which is still there. Uh, the very first kind of SRO uh, we built, converted the school, did the very, very first tax credit, low income housing tax credit deal that was ever done with Fannie Mae as an investor in North Philly. Um, and from there, um, other than the fact that that's where I met my husband and that's where um, our son was born, um, I then went to New York because Jean went off to New York. So we lived in Brooklyn for 20 plus years and I did a variety of housing development work. I worked in Queens. I was executive director of Habitat for Humanity in New York City, which was probably one of the most satisfying jobs I ever had because at that point Habitat took no government money so we raised all our money and it was wonderful because then we could just decide how we wanted to spend it. Um, and we did some pretty important things at that time. We, we finished off the, the famous Jimmy Carter buildings uh, on the Lower East Side and started doing infill housing. Um, we did one of the first projects in Brooklyn and Habitat, of course, and we did the first project, started the first project in Harlem. So we did a lot of housing there. I worked in Long Island at the Long Island Housing Partnership doing kind of consortium financing with banks for senior citizen housing. Um, worked in Queens doing economic development um, with the Queensborough president. We did some housing, but I was doing a lot of entrepreneur development um, in very, very diverse communities. And then um, worked with Housing Works in New York City, which was providing housing for people who were living with HIV and AIDS. And of course, some of the very early folks that I knew in Adams Morgan um, lived on Mentwood Place who died from AIDS. I mean, the impact of that was pretty, pretty heavy duty. Um, you know, people who had been involved in, in ammo organizing, um, people who had supported. I did a radio show in, in D.C. at one point with John Wilson before he ever became a member of the city council on WAMU. And we talked about local issues. And one of the people involved with that show died of AIDS. Um, so AIDS took its toll, uh, not just in the gay community and the arts community, but in the community development, you know, community as well. Um, so I, I built and managed housing for people who were homeless, but were also active drug users. So I did that with Housing Works. Um, and then I guess in 2009, came back to the district to work at HUD, uh, right in the aftermath of when the Recovery Act was passed by the Obama administration and we did the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, which was a national, hugely successful, even today, um, effort to put not only money on the street to help people um, buy foreclosed properties and make them affordable, but also um, a very, very successful effort at building capacity and local 
technical assistance efforts um, to build the capacity because people had forgotten how do you build affordable housing? How do you do the kind of, we never really got down to the kind of basic community organizing that people still, I think, don't quite know how to do every day. How do you bring people together? Yeah. Um, and how do people figure out what's in their own best self-interest? That's a very hard question because people don't know how their own self-interest connects to um, the decisions that get made that change their lives. And there's much of what you look back on now and you think, you know, this is, it's like, it's like your life passing in front of you. What happened to all that work? Because I think we've done a lousy job of um, succession planning, <laughs> for lack of another way of describing it. But we, sometimes I think we haven't done a very good job of bringing along the leadership that even has the notion that it's possible to change things. But then I look at the young people who are part of my son's you know, the 20s, and I'm like, oh, wow, you guys are doing it. Great. One of the young African-American men who was one of the first people that my son connected with in college, his name is James Hayes, James is organizing in Ohio. And one day, he, you know, and we've talked off and on, he was one of Chafin's best friends, and he, he said to me, do you know somebody named Cortland Cox? And I was like, <laughs> do I know Cortland Cox? Of course you know who Cortland Cox is. And Cortland is a part of what they call the SNCC elders um, who are now working with young people over, you know, all of these issues, the Black Lives Matter, and it's like, hey, maybe this is going to come around, you know. Um, I mean, I remember my early confrontations with, you know, with, with SNCC and being told, get out, <laughs> you know, just leave now. You, you don't need to be here. Um, which led to a very, very important moment for me in college because I was able to, because I was asked to live, leave a SNCC organizing conference, I ended up walking down the street to Ebenezer Baptist Church and meeting Martin Luther King and doing a very long interview, which was subsequently published with Coretta Scott King. So it's a very, it was a very important thing for me to have been told to leave. Um, but that, you know, that I think the question becomes, can we, can you bring people? I mean, I was a Jackson delegate uh, when Jesse Jackson ran for president and we elected all these local delegates. Um, and people forget the amazing organizing that he did and the people around him did. Um, the question becomes, can you, can you coalesce these folks back together uh, in a way that will make a significant difference? Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Thank that you. Wonderful. Could we, could, we, could we just ask uh, some follow-ups? Of course. <laughs> so, what? Uh, one, one thing about, uh, give some more detail about Carl Hess. He was coming out of this... Carl Hess was Barry Goldwater's speechwriter. And he came out of a, of a heavy-duty, libertarian, uh, really anarchist kind of history. And if you read any of his books and work now, you, you see what that history was. Um, I'm not quite sure how Carl got to the District of Columbia, except that obviously he worked for Barry Goldwater, so that's what brought him here. And when I met Carl the first time, um, he was living at, uh, on a boat at Buzzard's Point. Um, it was after he left the Buzzard's Point boat, I guess they all got evicted, or maybe he broke up a relationship, I don't remember, both. both. Um, that he came to live with us on Mentwood Place. And Carl had very, very new thoughts about what libertarianism, what being an anarchist meant, 
and it all had to do with the whole issues of local control, which is the reason why he was such a heavy duty supporter of the neighborhood government work that we were doing. He never disagreed that you needed regulation, that you needed regulatory framework, but that it should be controlled as locally as possible. Um, and if, if decisions could be made, major policy decisions could be debated and made in a town hall atmosphere people acted more responsibly. Not just because they were with their friends and neighbors, but because it allowed them to be educated about what was, in fact, in their own self-interest. Because I think what happens now is people become so isolated, they, they don't know. They don't know that, you know, Economic decisions are not in their own best self-interest. And I think Carl was an important, um, was an important thinker. And, and he actually, you know, he actually wanted to do things. It was more than just being a thinker. He actually wanted to do things. And he saw Adams Morgan as the... the as the laboratory. We were a great laboratory. There was no question yeah. that just like many, many things you think of historically, in the District of Columbia, I mean, look at urban renewal. We were the great laboratory in Southwest DC of urban renewal. You know, Eleanor Frank, Eleanor Roosevelt looked at all these, oh, people living there on the river with no indoor plumbing and we have to do something. And what did they do? They raised all of Southwest yeah. DC and moved all of 27,000 families moved from there to Shaw, basically. Um, so we've always been a great laboratory. I think the distinct part of what happened in Adams Morgan is that it was truly, you know, an effort from the bottom up. Yeah. It was not something that was like someone's great experiment. Um, and I think that was, that was an important, and I think the other thing that was so important about what we did is that it was premised on many different kinds of people, both economically and racially, being able to work together. Uh, the ammo flag, which my mother made, that said unity and diversity, you know. And also it was a neighborhood that had struggled to achieve school integration yeah. when People and you know, when it, what people maybe don't know or understand about when Marion Barry was elected mayor, he was a very, very important yeah. progressive leader. Yeah. Uh, to the very end, he was an important progressive leader. And those of us who were involved with his first administration, we really thought we were going to build a local government that was going to be different that would be very different, would be very progressive, that would be very locally based with advisory neighborhood commissions, and that's how decisions and policy got made. The problem, of course, was that Congress controlled everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that certainly was something that I think Hilda Mason and you know Julius Hobson and the people who started the D.C. Statehood Party believed. Yeah. You know, they were, they were the premise for, yeah, we can do this, and we can do it in a very different kind of way. It was a time of great optimism. Mm -hmm. And we did some pretty, you know, mm -hmm. there were some pretty amazing things that happened. I mean, Adams Morgan in the work that Marion Barry was doing, uh, he wasn't even on the school board at that point, around the pilot district project, took on the issues of police brutality that you know, could parallel right down the line what's going on now with Black Lives Matter. I suspect folks in Black Lives Matter know nothing about the Pilot District Project. So the question, I mean, maybe they do because Cortland's connected them. So we can hope that somebody like Cortland or, you know, Jimmy Garrett or somebody else would have connected them. Um.
the inspiration, I don't know if Saul Alinsky or any of Karen Kalias or Jim Vitarello, these names. Well, certainly Karen Kalias was, was important. I mean, she, um, she kind of came along as we were doing housing stuff and she was very involved in community development and financing and she actually gave me a job once when I really needed one which was at People's Involvement Corporation where we did we convinced Howard University president to give us some of the vacant houses in LaDroit Park mm -hmm. and I convinced the District of Columbia government to give us some loans and we actually rehabbed houses in LaDroit Park which was pretty cool those were all historic, so that was an exciting kind of time. Um, that was under the president who had been president forever. Uh, so Karen, I think, um, worked particularly um, at the HUD level with um, Gino Baroni and was an important kind of person. And I think Karen now works in Baltimore doing community development, if I'm correct. But I may be incorrect. But I think she's in Baltimore. Uh, Jim Vitarello. Jim, Jim was one of the uh, Jim was one of the thinkers, you know, who kind of took the concept of uh, community reinvestment and built on it. I think I can't remember the name of the nonprofit and the coalition that he put together. Um, and I think that was what was really interesting around. A lot of what was going on is that you had, you had these connections between people who were doing, to some extent, theoretical or research or whatever. But in Adams Morgan, you know, we, we, were, we were the doers. We were the ones who said, well, yeah, why not? I mean, you, I mentioned something about the Federal Communications Commission and what happened there. There were a group of public interest lawyers, um, Charles Firestone being one, um, who were very involved in the issues before the FCC around uh, local media and the fact that local media was becoming more and more consolidated and they filed the challenge um, to the FCC that led to um, you know, splitting up some of the, the media control between TV and it led to the rule that said that somebody, one corporation could not own a major newspaper, the radio and the television that spawned um, HUR being given to Howard University by WTOP and um, had a lot to do with what happened with the Washington Star. But we they, we were their lab. I mean, we were the community voice that said, yes, we don't think there should be local media control. Did you work with Nick DiMartino? On Absolutely. The community video center. Absolutely. Nick, Nick was kind of this like, amazing. he had also been a part of U.S. Student Press Association and College Press Service. And Nick said, we're starting this video project. And he would teach kids how to use video, how to use technology. Uh, he did the, the, I'm pretty sure it was Nick who did the, the famous tape that led to our dragging this movie around Congress to get them to fund Community Park West, uh, now Walter Pierce Park. So Nick was, Nick was an important part. Um, I think he lived with us at 1829 for a brief time. I can't remember how long, it was like a couple of months somewhere in there. Um, so the community video project I always saw as a kind of extension of much of what we were doing. Uh, community controlled schools, I mean that was, that was a whole thing at H.T. Cook and yeah. that's how Marie Reed got built. Yeah. The Marie Reed. That has an interesting history, but the after history is a real disappointment. So I understand. I do remember when the pool first opened down there, because I, I swim. <laughs> it was so crazy because the pool at Marie Reed, uh, 
had so many different cultures swimming in the pool yes. that you could never bring order, yes. you know, to who was swimming what lane and yeah. were they all going this way or were they going this way or that. that. It was kind of like the community garden story. It was like, oh my God. It was, the lifeguards just had no control over that pool at all. Right. It was always free swim. And it was noisy all the time. Always noisy. 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 Of course, you know, it was on it was on Mintwood Place that we had the first Mintwood Place block party that within about three years became Adams Morgan Day, uh, and the people on Mintwood Place hated it after that. They were like, "Oh, Adams Morgan Day, where'd all these people come from, etc." I can remember when they were doing um, they were they were doing they started doing evening stuff at what was then Avignon Frere, and some of the younger folks in the community decided we're going to stand around outside and scare them. So maybe they'll all go away. They had these groups of young men kind of grouping around, around the evening at Avignon Frere, hoping that these people would go away and not come here to eat this French food. Um, and, you know, the whole thing about the bars, everybody was like, up in arms about every everything you opened up was about the bar. I uh, remember when Columbia Station opened; it was like, oh no. Right. Um, this is the original Columbia Station. This is yeah. when Adams Morgan didn't want to be another Georgetown. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> and in fact, that it was a big deal about the subway whether or not we're going to have a metro stop in Adams Morgan and it ended up at Woodley because people didn't want the metro stop because it would become like, and that's exactly why Georgetown has no metro stop. Yeah. Yeah. They fought against it. And they what, lost out. What, what, what year was that debate? I, I don't know. I don't know what year it was to be honest. It would have been. Didn't metro open in 70? Metro opened in 76. 76. So that would have come. Yeah, but they were still building parts of it. So 72, 73. Yeah. Construction took a few years. Quite a few years. Yeah. It's a big, a big disaster now, the Metro. Well, look at who designed it. It was designed by the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers had never designed anything for public wide public use, you know, that's not what they had ever done. And then, of course, Congress stopped funding any maintenance. Well, and also the surrounding jurisdictions, especially Virginia, refused to, to, to I mean, it's partially their fault. Yeah. They didn't want to contribute to maintenance. By the way, it's 2.30, so. Okay. <laughs>